just waiting for people to connect to audio. Yeah, sorry to keep people, just be a few more minutes while people uh, just uh, get their audio working. So I think everyone's connected to audio now. So a very warm welcome to this, our very first Greek dialogue of the academic year 2020 to 2021. Uh, just wait for, I've oh, got a couple more people. Hello, Daphne, nice to, I can't see you, but <laughs> welcome anyway, and welcome everyone else. Uh, my name's Tim Whitmarsh, I'm the, uh, the co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Greek Studies. Um, this is a, a series that we started last year, and the idea is really just to range across the entire spectrum of Greek studies from antiquity up to the present day, hopefully trying to do it in an accessible way that creates um, community and um, creates, I mean, as you would expect, dialogue between all sorts of different kinds of Hellenists. Um, we're not just uh, literary or language or anything like that. We are also interested in material culture, which is one of the reasons why we've got our excellent speaker um, today with us. Uh, we are welcoming people from uh, over several platforms. Um, the people I can see now are on Zoom, but we hopefully have some people on Facebook and YouTube as well. Uh, if you're on Facebook or, or YouTube and you want to ask a question at the end, the way to ask them will be via the chat function. Uh, our excellent uh, administrator, Greg, will be monitoring very carefully and he'll be able to pick up your questions there and he'll pop them uh, into a message to me. So I'll be able to pose them to Anastasia, but other pe people who are uh, here via Zoom will be able to ask their questions in person or by chat as you like. Okay, so without any further ado, let me hand over to Anastasia Christophilopoulou, who is the assistant keeper for Greek and Roman and Cypriot antiquities at the Fitzwilliam Museum, and is running a fascinating project that I hope some of you at least have had the chance to look into a little bit, which is on uh, the major islands and their role in um, art and material culture in antiquity. So over to you, Anastasia. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for this very kind introduction and a great many thanks as well to Greg for setting this up and uh, helping me um, um, organize uh, uh, everything around it. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, today and uh, to see uh, um, this lovely community of researchers, both from the ancient and uh, the medieval, the Byzantine and the modern uh, Greek world. Um, which gives us a great pleasure to, um, to have as an audience for our project, because it's exactly what this is about, as I'm hoping you'll be able to discover. It is uh, a project that links both the ancient and uh, the modern reality of, uh, um, of island Greece. So um, without uh, um, uh, further delay, I'll start sharing my presentation now, and uh, so we can, uh, we can commence the... This uh, project is uh, um, a new research and exhibition project based at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, which involves the archaeological investigation of island identities on Cyprus, Crete and Sardinia between the early Bronze Age and to the end of antiquity, but as well as including many aspects of the islander's identity in a medieval and modern uh, sense. I'd like to explain how we got into uh, this project and uh, why we decided to work on a, on a diachronic uh, perspective, which is not really what uh, we were used to do in the Antiquities Department of the Fitzwilliam. So around 2018, uh, we were completing a previous smaller research project on Cyprus in particular, in which we aimed to contextualize uh, the entire of our Cyprus archaeological collection with any new evidence and uh, knowledge we have gained over the history of uh, archaeological excavations in Cyprus between the time we acquired these uh, objects and uh, now. And that was roughly 150 years. So a lot of these objects, of course, needed to be reassessed under the light of uh, new investigations and new theories that exist in Mediterranean and Cyprus archaeology. While we were doing that, uh, um, we also started getting frustrating, frustrated because we thought we were missing the opportunity to address some of the wider sociocultural phenomena we were actually observing as part of this material in the ancient world uh, with museum projects. So we noticed uh, that uh, we did not, uh, a lot of the projects that uh, 
um, emphasize on aspects of uh, life and important phenomena that still affect us massively today did not go beyond the focus of the ancient collections of the museum. So we wanted to change that. This way, we initiated uh, this project called Being an Islander. Um, so we started it for two reasons. The first one was because we wanted to investigate what defines island identity in the Mediterranean through material culture. We wanted to explore how insularity affects and shapes cultural identity using the three examples of Cyprus, Crete, and Sardinia. By doing this, we want to provide the platform to debate cultural evolution in the islands as opposed to the surrounding mainlands, and in the same time to respond to this frustration mentioned before, that museums often miss the opportunity to address wider sociocultural phenomena when researching their collections because they focus too much on examining these objects as artworks, detached of their original context. The second reason we initiated the project was because our initial idea coincided with the time of the Brexit referendum. Given the social turmoil that it created, we saw it fit to extend the project in a public engaging way to include current discourses of island versus mainland cultural identity, including, of course, Britain's own debated island identity, but also Greece's debates on European identity. Throughout history, islands have been treated as distinct places, unlike mainland and continental masses. The perception of island life has never been neutral. Rather, the term insularity, being of an islander, of an island, has been romanticized and associated with otherness. Yet, connectivity has also been an important feature of island life, as the sea can be a linking rather than a dividing body, motivating and maintaining informal and formal connections. This has been evident in the study of the archaeology, art, and history of the Mediterranean islands, but they have nevertheless been deemed to have different de developmental trajectories from a mainland with particular and more readily isolated socio-political, cultural, and economic trends. The cultural history of the Mediterranean, and particularly of the large islands of the Mediterranean, from antiquity to the present day, is very complex and can narrate as well as explain multiple sociocultural phenomena. Islands such as Cyprus, Crete, and Sardinia demonstrate through their art and material culture production a continuous battle or influence or assimilation between indigenous forms and representations with patterns, art techniques, and forms traveling from the surrounding mainland regions. Cyprus, Crete, and Sardinia have not just been places with expansive contacts by sea, but also lucky for the transmission of many innovative products and ideas across a variety of people from the Near East and the rest of the Mediterranean. These ideas in transit go on to become the major trends in the art of the Bronze Age, the early Iron Age, the classical and later Roman, as well as medieval periods. Furthermore, new theoretical advances in the fields of archaeology Cultural anthropology, as well as history, now securely link Cyprus, Crete, and other islands with major cultural and historical events in the Near East, North Africa, and, West, and, West, and the West Mediterranean. To exemplify this, the shift from the end of the Bronze Age, for example, to the beginning of the early Iron Age, in the Eastern Mediterranean is marked by patterns of decentralization accompanied by the so-called media revolution in the form of the invention of the Greek alphabet and a dramatic explosion of figural art. Conversely, large Mediterranean islands during the Roman period, such as Crete and Cyprus, have been characterized as either experiencing a period of tranquil obscurity, while Rome's cultural influence on them is all pervading, or as struggling to maintain a distinct cultural identity. Another example comes from the island of Sardinia during the Bronze Age period, when the island's innovations are typically defined by economic, social, and demographic characteristics, while the Nuragic identity is implicitly taken to be passive, a product of their socioeconomic circumstances. However, the material record clearly illustrates that the history of the Nuragic identity is implicated in social developments on Sardinia during the second millennium. 
While these events and phenomena have been illustrated by archaeological projects and finds and continue to be debated among archaeologists, historians, and cultural historians of the ancient Mediterranean, there has never been a research project with a strong public engaging perspective that addresses and summarizes this research debate by highlighting these important transitions and phenomena with key artifacts and interactive installations. Our project addresses this need and extends uh, to testing the definition of island identity on specific material culture examples in the context of the three islands under study. Its originality lies in, the, in its diachronic scope, analytical approach, as well as its multiscalar approach to human interaction with continental, within continental and island environments. Furthermore, the exhibition will address and confront several important current debates in Mediterranean archaeology, such as the perceived disciplinary division between Aegean prehistory and classical archaeology, the issue of regionalism, and finally, the descriptive rather than the interpretive approaches to interaction. And I think that some of these problems are also um, existing beyond antiquity into other um, disciplines that study the Mediterranean. So the project will finally reconsider assumptions about island isolation and the ways in which islanders interact with inhabitants of other islands and the mainland. In course of the second and the first millennium BC, but as well as by drawing um, examples and analogies from later periods in the Mediterranean. After all, connectivity and not just isolation and boundedness has been an important feature of island life, as the sea can be a linking rather than a dividing body. So who is exactly working on this, uh, on this beast, as we call it affectionately in the museum? It's a very large team of people consisting from uh, micro teams within the Fitzwilliam Museum. That includes a very strong analytical and conservation research team. Um, and I believe some of us, some of them are, are here today in this, uh, in this presentation, but as well as contemporary artists such as Yorgos Petru, a celebrated Greek Cypriot artist who brings an additional very important dialectic between the material cultures of the ancient world and contemporary art to the project by creating a series of installations that correspond to the archaeological finds we use in the show. And of course, uh, our head of exhibitions and programming, David Evans, uh, who is uh, amazing in conceptualizing these ideas and theories that we present uh, daily to him into a meaningful display. Uh, the project has received renewed funding from the Leventis Foundation and very recently as well from the Niarchos Foundation in Greece. And, uh, and has uh, the full support, uh, uh, including financial help of the Cyprus High Commission, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, and a few other uh, secondary funders, including, of course, uh, funding through the Fitzwilliam Museum and the University of Cambridge. Um, so what the exhibition will actually show, the, the, the actual display, which will happen in 2023, is objects from the Aegean and Cypriot collections, um, uh, as well as an ambitious lending schedule from prominent national museums, the Department of Antiquities in Cyprus, uh, the Ministry of Culture in Greece, the Directorate of Antiquities, but as well as uh, the uh, uh, Polo Museale della Sardegna, which is the organization that uh, manages museums and archaeological sites in Sardinia. Regarding the chronological time frame, as I mentioned, this is broad. Um, and of course, the end date uh, that we had originally placed during the um, uh, um, around the second century AD is, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, not. Uh, um, uh, it, it doesn't. It doesn't include all the scopes of the project. We extend far beyond that in terms of bringing further analogies into the um, uh, by projects of the of the of the whole um, of the whole um, the whole uh, project. So. Um, other outcomes include uh, the uh, publication of a peer-reviewed edit volume, which will combine up to 10 essays by internationally acclaimed experts in the fields of Mediterranean archaeology, insularity and mobility in the ancient world, as well as an illustrated catalogue of uh, the um, exhibition. We are also aiming for an international conference, which will be in, the, in late 2022, so about six months before the opening of the exhibition, 
uh, in which we want to present the results of our research project during the past three years, as well as prepare a very good debate uh, around the display of the exhibition. Um, the project has uh, very strong potentials for developing parallel contents in the fields of digital humanities and digital heritage. And for this, we are working together with a number of other organizations, for example, the Cyprus Institute of Nicosia, but of course, here at home, the McDonald Institute for Archaeology. And we are planning a number of actions, including the reconstruction of digital archaeological landscapes and a virtual reality element. Uh, which will enhance the exhibition's display and create an immersive experience for our audience. Uh, there is also great uh, um, um, potential for public engagement and outreach and learning outcomes. And this is exactly what the focus of the Niarchos uh, um, research grant we just received uh, is about, uh, as well as uh, um, a grant by the Cyprus High Commission. Um, we plan a wide program of public inclusive activities, um, uh, sorry, activities and outputs, as well as a program of events and activities that enhance the exhibitions and the museum's visibility internationally. We explore the, this through a variety of media, including contemporary art interventions, workshops, public lectures and short film screenings, as well as peripheral events hosted in London to increase the exhibition's impact, as well in the Greek and the Cypriot diaspora. Our themes while we do uh, this work is the Aegean Sea, island culture and architecture, seafaring and trading routes from antiquity to the present day, as well as the evolution of spoken language and the idiosyncrasies of Greek dialects in Cyprus and in Crete. We are now halfway through the implementation of the research project, and we are now able to look on, uh, on, uh, on a number of uh, uh, impressive results uh, from this uh, uh, um, four year um, long project. The first one I would like to mention is the amazing work conducted at the museum by a team of conservators and research analysts, Susanna Pancaldo, Emma Bauzit, as well as Jana Mokrisova, a research uh, associate to the project uh, um, uh, who specializes on archaeometallurgy. So their work uh, is uh, related with the metallurgy of Cyprus and Sardinia, but in terms of research, uh, um, it is now confined to the material of the Fitzwilliam because, of course, we cannot, we are not able to analyze material that doesn't belong uh, to us for the moment. We aim to investigate research aspects of ancient metallurgy to identify ancient metallurgical technology and practices of copper, bronze, iron, and precious metals from our own collection, and then possibly link this to the social choices, agency, and hopefully in reconstructing aspects of the island's ancient identities. It also offers us an opportunity to investigate the social context of technological choices and precise steps in the process of the production, what we call in archaeology, the bulk of conservation treatment and research analysis of the exhibitions and 160 objects intended for the display will also take place between September 2020 and December 2022. This work involves a microscopic examination, photographic and written documentation, and a holistic assessment of the object's condition, including analysis employing UV imaging, microscopy, X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and fiber optics reflectance spectroscopy. And here you see some of the groups that have been currently analyzed by uh, our group of uh, um, analytical scientists and conservators. In terms of digital uh, innovation, we are developing a strong curriculum in the fields of digital humanities and digital heritage. So for this, we're including uh, the creation of an exhibition microsite, as well as uh, a Google Arts and Cultural exhibit, which is an exhibit or online feature will be added to this platform using the rich storytelling interfaces, which will enable us to reach an audience at scale one that does not visit our website and the museum uh, normally. Um, I already mentioned the element of virtual reality to which we are collaborating with Dr. Yorgos Sartopoulos of the uh, Cyprus Institute. And we're also developing another by project called Linking Islands of Data. This is an U uh, HRC funded project by project of the larger project which involves the creation of a network based around centers of excellence that study the classical world on both sides of the Atlantic and builds on the legacy of the National Endowment for Human Humanities, um, um, of the National Endowment of Humanities. There's a number of, uh, um, of similar projects that operate in the UK with collaborators in the US uh, um, 
um, at the moment, and we are one of five, I think. So how does that all lead in terms of uh, uh, creating the thematics and the narrative of the exhibition? This is exactly what you can see on this uh, on this uh, on this uh, on this slide. So what we are doing is uh, um, developing the main thematics of the exhibition as we go along with our research themes. And so far, these include settlement formation and evolution, housing, also the notions of family and community structure, death, perceptions of death, art and iconography of death, economy, internal resources, economy and agriculture, food production and consumption, as well as the relationship between uh, economy and mobility. And lastly, language, formation of language and island identity, mobility, trade networks, and social interactions across the Levant, Cyprus, Crete, the Aegean, and the Italian islands. Specific case studies are then explored through these uh, main narrative themes, uh, and we don't aim at exploring everything in every uh, single period we include in this project, but we're building our content, uh, our content uh, through meaningful uh, uh, paradigms. It has been long recognized that mobility is one of the defining characteristics of the ancient Eastern Mediterranean societies. While the intensity of this phenomenon may have arrived through time and space, and not all members of any particular community may have shared equally in it, mobility and the connectivity it engendered endowed the region with its particular characteristics. Mobility um, presupposes destinations, both midpoints and endpoints. The interaction between the various modes of mobility will form the main focus of this uh, um, research project display, uh, but as well as uh, the conference we are aiming to. It is, is it possible to identify and define cultural changes that reflect variations in the level of a community's interaction with lines of mobility? Can uh, established paths uh, be identified? And if so, how did they change through time? Did the unequal and mutable intensity or interconnectivity play a role in rendering some communities more resilient than others through times of stress? Mobility might be recurrent, as in the case of those who may be labeled, labeled traders, or it may have involved what has deemed to be a one-off movement, as imagined by those who have been called colonists, and mobility need not be long distance. These are some of the questions we are exploring in this theme. Another narrative we are developing is the study of ancient island food practices, including cultivation, preparation, and consumption practices within um, the island of Cyprus and Crete. Prior to the 1990s, narratives of food preparation consumption were limited to the social context of food and drink vessels used as evidence to communal me meals or access of social class to material culture. But recent research in archaeology has produced an immense amount of information for our understanding of consumption in antiquity. While scientific disciplines within archaeology, archaeo botany, uh, archaeozoology, have helped answer questions about ancient diets, their variations and impact on ancient societies, as well as place the study of ancient food as a marker of ancient cultural identity. However, very little of this discourse uh, in scientific advances has influenced exhibition narratives or permanent museums displays, not just in the UK, but around the world as well and even less so within museums displaying collections from the ancient Mediterranean regions. So we wanted to address this gap and restore it um, and address ancient cultivation and consumption practices as an important socioeconomic aspect of the study of antiquity and the archaeology of Cyprus and Crete in, in particular. Last but not least, the project is concerned uh, uh, with, other, um, um, with other times than the ancient times. Throughout its long history, the Mediterranean Sea has served as a link between diverse peoples, cultures, territories, and nations. In many respects, one could... Uh, um, In many respects, the Mediterranean region, to different degrees at different times and in different places, um, has served as a unified entity. However, despite commonly held views, uh, there is, uh, for example, Cyprus being a bridge between the Orient and Occident, 
there is no doubt that the Mediterranean has and continues to have more than its share of contradictions, divisions, and boundaries between the Middle East and Europe, or the European North and the African South, between Christianity and Islam, between modernity and tradition, between the First World and the Third. Even within a single country, remote and rugged mountainous regions often form focal points for resistance to centralized or, extend, or external control. One example of this is that during the 20th century, nationalist movements were fostered and nurtured in the highlands of Cyprus, Morocco, and Algeria. Such divisions reasonably could be extended backwards in time, but in each case, we would also uncover the role of the Mediterranean as an intermediary, as both a frontier and a passage, an area where movement, migrations, and cultural encounters resulted in an interlaced heritage that both reflects and creates Mediterranean histories. Those who see cultural integrity and at least a borderline identity within the Mediterranean may lament the impact of others, yet they also celebrate the hybridization of ideas, cultures, and peoples that results. Migration, finally, is uh, another very distinctive and elusive topic in the diachronic study of the Mediterranean. Whether we encounter, we encounter it and examine it in an organized and substantial way, or when we observe it in a Brownian motion, um, borrowing the term from the study of population movements in sociology. In its modern sense, uh, there is not a universally accepted definition of migration, or rather, there are many definitions of human migration, each of them answering this question in a rather different way. For instance, migration is a process of moving either across a defined border or within a state. It is a population movement encompassing any kind of movements of people, whether it's length, composition, and causes. It includes migration of refugees, displaced persons, and economic migrants. One could argue that the scale and the synthesis of migration in the geographical and chronological framework we have examined it uh, uh, here was far more linear. Sorry, um, uh, in, the, in antiquity was far more linear than what we are actually able to see today. No matter its definition, migration is a crucial characteristic of both ancient and modern worlds. Today, migration is a defining global issue as more and more people are on the move than any other point in human history. Documenting this global phenomenon requires a huge amount of quantitative and qualitative aspects, many of them needing to be interdisciplinary in nature. So when these are not documented in real time, it's very hard to prove that large population movements have happened when the transition is over and they leave very little material trace behind. And to this, I'd like to bring you two modern examples of migration as we're witnessing them today or witnessed them in uh, recent decades. Um, one of them is the example of the vast migration from Syria uh, through Turkey into the Aegean Islands that we have uh, that has been unfolding in the past decade in Greece. Um, so if, for example, you were to take the examples of the vast migrant camps existing in the island of Lesbos, such as the Moria camp or the Karatepe camp, um, um, the Moria one being completely destroyed by fire a few months ago, and then, of course, the next day is bulldozed and being uh, wiped out uh, and cleaned so that people can move uh, into different settings, uh, um, you would have very little material culture evidence of that. So if you were to identify uh, traces of that migration, say, 100 years from now as an archaeologist, you would indeed find very little material culture to prove this to you. And this maybe should serve as an example to our study of uh, migration in the past. Another contemporary example is the wave of Cip well um, uh, of the past decades is the wave of Cypriot immigrants to the UK, a wave that started, as we know, in Cyprus in 1902 and increased dramatically during the 1950s when violence on the island intensified during the anti-colonial struggles. Today, the Greek Cypriot expatriate community is one of over 200 minorities that compose the United Kingdom's diverse population. However, the exact size of the community is unsurprisingly difficult to determine, and concrete evidence of the ethnolinguistic difference of the community versus the wider population is difficult to determine. 
language is a key characteristic here because although it is still being projected by these heritage communities as an important part of their island identity, it is also completely assimilated into English as a certain aspect of Cypriot id idioms is the main form of communication. What I would like to do here is to use these two contemporary examples to rethink our practice of studying migration in the ancient Mediterranean. In archaeology, we use the topic of migration as a marker of distinct cultural change, claiming that the movement of people and the establishment of their new communities immediately signifies the arrival of new cultural norms and behaviors. Also, only recently we have begun to see the movement of people as a social phenomenon and as a structured process which can indeed be investigated archaeologically or with historical evidence. What then can we learn from contemporary migration trends while trying to better understand what might have happened in the past? I think two things. One is that strong material and linguistic evidence, such as, for example, can be the presence of a bilingual inscription. And here you see one of the famous bilingual inscriptions we possess from ancient Cyprus, the Italian uh, um, bilingual inscription. Uh, containing uh, two texts, one written in um, early Cyprosyllabic script and the other one in um, um, Phoenician. Um, so these evidence can look to the archaeological record as undisputable proof of the presence of a foreign migrant, culturally or ethnically different group, but could at the same time be perceived by the population who lived there at the time as already something of their local mixed or shared identity. And secondly, that while a migrant community might still retain and project strong cultural ties and memories with the motherland, they may not display material or linguistic evidence of these affinities anymore, which is what we saw in the example of, uh, which, which means that in the case of an archaeological investigation, it makes, this, it makes them invisible to us. So last with this exhibition, we want to address linguistic aspects of the islanders' identities. Within the modern Mediterranean, some of the undeniable linguistic boundaries that exist, uh, described uh, uh, sometimes as a cacophony rather than a polyphony, may be more apparent than real. Some islanders, for example, may have a dialect quite distinct from that of their closest mainland kin. Witness, for example, the Cypriot, modern Cypriot or Cretan dialects of Greek. Other islanders, however, especially those involved in commercial enterprise or divided by political agendas are multilingual. Witness, for example, the Maltese, Italian and English widely spoken on Malta. The Catalan uh, dialects and Spanish spoken on the Balearics, or the Greek, Turkish, and English spoken on Cyprus. Within the prehistoric or protohistoric Mediterranean, too, linguistic boundaries could be outdated, and we must assume that at least some of the inhabitants of different regions had the ability to communicate in more languages than one. In the Eastern Mediterranean, for example, Bronze Age archives from the coastal site of Ungarita include documents written in eight different scripts, representing as many different languages, somehow used or understood by the scribes, merchants, and traders who worked in these antipodes. A form of peripheral Arcadian, for example, served as the lingua franca throughout the late Bronze Age Levant, whilst the Greek may have served as a similar medium within and beyond the Iron Age Aegean. We are very keen to observe and represent uh, these variations as part of our exhibition project. At the same time, we are aware that this is something that rarely museums do. Therefore, we address this debate to interdisciplinary groups of researchers within and outside uh, Cambridge, such as the one um, I, um, I'm very happy to see uh, here tonight, and certainly beyond the remit of, of archaeology and the ancient world. And last but not least, we approach the, the subjects of insularity and mobility with the sense that islanders' cultural identities are always in a state of becoming, a journey in which they never arrive. Who they are is not a rock that is passed on from one generation to the, to, to the other generation. It's not fixed and unchanging. Cultural identity is, after all, a process and not a product. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, no, that's wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of an echo now. <laughs> um, can I, um, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a few questions. Um, can I suggest that people um, raise their hands in the participant? So you, you just uh, click on the participant panel at the bottom. And if you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand. But let me kick off with a sort of obvious question really, which is why no Sicily? So yes, we, we had a debate about Sicily and you're right, uh, um, Sicily would have been a, a very good candidate to this. The reason we left, uh, the, the reason we left Sicily out of this is that uh, um, uh, the, uh, um, well, the reason actually Sardinia prevailed over the choice of uh, Sicily is because there's been already a number of uh, large projects involving Sicily particularly around the uh, uh, large exhibitions. One has been at the BM only four years ago. Um, and uh, at the same time, we think that uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 the field, uh, both the archeological, the historical, but also the linguistic uh, um, reality in Sardinia, both ancient and modern, is a far better example as a case study for what we're trying to do here. It's also a far more unexplored uh, region. Um, and the second reason is that uh, the islands we picked, uh, Crete, Cyprus and Sardinia, have some very important strong links uh, throughout uh, a, a broad uh, chronological framework. And we wanted to emphasize on this. There has been a lot of discussion on uh, the role of Sicily and uh, the links of Sicily with other Mediterranean regions. Um, some of them also within museum projects, and we just thought it was time to actually do something different and go beyond that. Interesting, yeah, and if I could just ask a very quick follow-up to that, which is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, in a very simplistic sense, you know, the transition from Bronze Age to Iron Age was, uh, you know, was all about shipping and about the, you know, the Mediterranean as a sort of chessboard that, you know, um, you know, you, you united east and west, and south, and so forth. Um, Sicily obviously became really important at that point because it was at the centre of that chessboard. So, um, is is it right? Would it be right to say that Sicily's distinctive role as a sort of you know um, uh, a kind of melting pot, but also a crossing point? Um, isn't shared by the other islands, that someone like Cyprus is perhaps less, um, because it's geographically marginal in the, the Mediterranean, at least in the Iron Age, um, is, is, you know, the, the, the narrative is different there. It is different. Um, and I think here what plays an important role is from which uh, viewpoint you're looking at that. So if you're actually yeah. sitting somewhere in uh, central Greece or, you know, um, 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 the region of Athens in North Peloponnese, um, looking at uh, the reality of Sicily and what uh, changes are happening there during that very important moment, as you mentioned, uh, would have been more apparent. If you're sitting in the coastline of Syria, um, uh, the amazing changes that happened during the early Iron Age in Cyprus and, and, and really, uh, you know, it's the, the, you know this, is, this is Cyprus is the road through the introduction of the Greek alphabet comes into any other part of the of, of, of the known you know Greek word uh, it's equally very important so you are right and I think we will never we will never get it right uh, um, if we try to uh, um, look at it at different you know standpoints or viewpoints and every reality, you know, if we are looking at insularity from the point of view of Sardinia to the outside world, we will come up with different assumptions. The same would happen if we are doing the same job, looking, uh, being in Crete and looking towards the connections with the Aegean, North Africa or the Levant. Um, so what we're trying to do here is uh, um, not to try and cover all aspects, but to bring out distinctive case studies that uh, show us examples of how insularity manifests itself. Um, and, and you're right, we will never be able to, to follow everything. So, you know, 
Sicily, in a way, it's an omission. You know, I, I'm very happy to accept that. It's just that we could never actually build it. You know, we would need maybe, a, I don't know, a six year project if we included that island as well. And we are already, you know, with a fourth year, pro four year project, we are stretching it to the limits of our capacity. Uh, but I do hope that once we're done this, uh, uh, we kind of enter a more uh, ongoing discussion about uh, how we view this phenomena, including islands of uh, other islands such as Sicily. Malta is another very good example, which again yep. we left outside for other reasons, um, mostly because it was too impractical for us to address the archaeological reality there. We at the Fitzwilliam have nothing from Malta, so we would be starting from zero. Um, um, so it's not, you know, that doesn't mean that island is not important. It's just that think of this as, um, as an experiment, um, which include three strong case studies with full awareness that we're leaving some out. And actually we have thought in our introductory panels, we're going to address this. We're going to explain what we've left out and why um, to make sure that people don't think these three islands are the center of the world. It's exactly what we don't want to do. Great, okay, thank you very much. Now, Greg, could you ask Garth Foden to unmute and Elizabeth will ask a question via Garth's <laughs> Zoom account. I think you can hear me now, but I can't uh, do the video. Can We can. We, we, we can hear you, yeah. Right. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Yes, my, my computer decided to start um, restarting in the moment when you were beginning. So I'm, I'm Garth right now. Um, my question springs from the object. Um, I would really like you to tell me about your favorite two objects that you're most excited about having available that, that you can actually show in this exhibition. And so I wanted to see more of the th things uh, and, and also because it's quite overwhelming how many people you've got excited about your project. And also in a way to help uh, particularize that statement that you left in the last slide, because I felt that it was a statement that I don't know whether you could put it back. It doesn't matter now. I'd rather hear about okay. your. But I felt that it was so general. I wondered to what extent you really could argue that it pertained particularly to the problem of islands. You're thinking about this tension between the insularity and the connectivity. So, mm -hmm. how about a couple of your the objects that you feel that are really important to show us? So um, I can actually show you some of these objects. Um, let me see if. Uh... Um, can can I can I do um, um, like a very quick share screen again, Greg? Yeah. Okay. So um, here is. So here is one. Um, yes. So uh, can you see it? Huh? You can see the slide up. It, so on the right, uh, you have a beautiful head uh, of a beardless uh, young man from Salamis, uh, which is part of a clay, a mold cast uh, uh, statue. The one on the left as well is similar. Um, it's from the same production, but well, not similar, but from the same kind of group of objects. So this, I think it's uh, one uh, amazing expression of uh, insularity in, uh, in uh, in, in Cyprus and definitely not in the sense of uh, being, uh, you know, uh, in the periphery of the Eastern Mediterranean, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite else. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it shows how the island coped with the fact that Cyprus is uh, the only large Mediterranean island that doesn't have any marble or any other really well suitable material for carving. So they couldn't really carve sculpture and they compromised when they got to the point that they really needed to show sculptural creations, they compromised with uh, making everything out of clay. And when I say everything, I don't just mean small statuettes. I mean, these things could be as two meters tall. 
not the one you're seeing now that was about uh, 70 centimeters total if it was, uh, uh, you know, complete. Uh, but we have, uh, uh, you know, freestanding, proper, you know, taller than, you know, the average modern person uh, statuettes. And it was an, a unique production that went on for about 100 years and then disappeared. When it disappears, it's because the island has formed uh, uh, kingdoms who basically import uh, prime materials such as marble and other, you know, nice to carve stone from outside, including the sculptors and the artists who can make that. But for those 100 years before that period, they compromised, the, it, actually they innovated, they did not compromise in the best way. And this is one example of that. So that's, that's something that we will be using to talk about, uh, um, you know, um, how an island basically uh, works out its way into creating art uh, um, while they're missing the prime material for it. Um, and the other object I wanted to uh, show you, um, I don't have a preference for Cyprus, you know, this happens now, I have many preferred objects, but uh, um, this is um, 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 this is another one from Cyprus, um, and this is uh, um, a type of uh, wine carrying uh, uh, vessel, which is globular, um, and uh, in uh, uh, this one, we have the amazing stylized patterns of two birds that look like uh, arrows uh, to you, uh, pointing towards the rim and the neck, um, and uh, it might look like, you know, it looks like a very beautiful object, you know, it's a very intricate shape, uh, but uh, making this object required some very advanced technology, because you can't actually make it in the wheel uh, uh, as one. You have to make two uh, semi-circular surfaces and then unite them in a very particular way. And uh, learning how to use that technology was something that uh, must have taken the potters of the island uh, nearly 50 years. Um, and then they go into this most amazing creations of these uh, globular flasks for about 100 years again, uh, and then that technique disappears. But these objects become prized possessions for anyone who could uh, uh, buy them across the Eastern Mediterranean. So you find them in... Uh, uh, places around the Syro-Palestinian uh, um, coastline, uh, southern, what is southern modern Turkey, Africa, uh, Greece as well. Um, so these are two of my favorites, uh, but uh, I have many others as well from Crete and other islands. From Sardinia, I didn't mention that, uh, but we are actually bringing uh, 70 objects from the National Museums of Sardinia because the Fitzwilliam doesn't have objects from Sardinia. So for us, it's really a bold statement of uh, uh, dealing with the material culture of an island, which is not reflected in our collections. And that's, I want to mention that because that's how I started my talk, uh, that with this project, we want to do something that goes well beyond our collections. Now about the statement that you mentioned, uh, I didn't say that, but this statement is actually written for the Pacific Islands. Uh, still, I think it does reflect uh, a great deal of analogy with some of the phenomena we see in uh, the islands of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and I want to think of that not in its ancient, ancient form as well, uh, but also in its modern form. Um, I come from an island, I come from Crete, and in many times through um, my interactions with the island, um, I have felt that uh, our sense of identity as, you know, modern Cretans is always in a state of becoming. It is something that changes far more easily and not in a negative way. It changes more easily just because we are kind of engineered to adapt better than uh, people who come from the mainland. But well, this is my perception. So for me, that statement is something that reflects what's happening in our project. Uh, and I think that some of the other people in our group agree as well. But as I say, this exhibition is something that will be open for debate. So please come and discuss how you see it when the display is open, because we want to hear different views as well. Great. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Uh, do we have any other questions? If people, as I say, if people want to 
signal that, oh yes, we have Daphne Martin wow. asking a question. Uh, so Greg, if you could invite Daphne and perhaps Yorgos to uh, unmute. Oh. We will get there. <laughs> Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, thank you Anastasia for that uh, wonderful presentation and the really ambitious project um, that your team is taking on. Um, so I have a question about artistic production specifically um, as a sort of a way of framing island identity and thinking also in particular of sort of the way that artistic production is manifested um, also on the Cycladic islands in modern times, the way, for example, um, an, island, an island like Dinos has a very specific sort of tradition in marble craftsmanship, whereas Sifnos um, is associated more with terracotta um, and pottery. And so I was struck by what you said with regards to the terracotta objects on Cyprus. Um, and so I was wondering to what extent you're considering using um, artistic production as sort of a thematic grouping for thinking about um, identity on these islands as well. We are, yes, uh, we certainly are. And uh, the way we do that is by bringing um, uh, particular examples that we think are, you know, are, are really good highlights of that situation uh, all the way from the early Bronze Age down to the third uh, century AD. Um, but the other thing we are doing, and to this I'm actually, if, if he doesn't mind, I'm going to, um, I'm going to pass the, uh, uh, pass the um, you know, ask him to comment on that, uh, is we are trying to uh, um, make a link between uh, ancient artistic product production and uh, the way artists today uh, could see and think and reflect on that. Uh, um, trying to, what we're trying to avoid here is uh, uh, too many archaeologists and art historians overthinking about uh, artistic production in antiquity, and this is why Yorgos is uh, Yorgos Petru is uh, one of uh, uh, is uh, one of our participants in this talk, uh, but he is the resident contemporary artist for this project, uh, and there's only one. It's only him uh, because we think we think his work encapsulates uh, exactly perfectly what we're trying to do. So if, if he doesn't mind, Jorgo, would you like to comment on that? Um, hi. Yes, I don't mind. Could you please repeat the question? Because I was trying to figure out something because I had my hand raised before. So I was trying to write another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah the question was uh, um, about uh, how we see and understand artistic production um, in specific islands and times, and uh, um, mm. sorry, I, I, I forgot your name. Uh, Daphne, Daphne was asking, uh, was bringing the example of the you know Cycladic marble figurine production, which is of mm. course a very distinctive type of art. You know, we have some in the museum. You you've seen them as well. We're actually leaving them out of this exhibition, um, but uh, um, it's one of the examples of how we emphasize on specific types of production material and how these link with these communities. And what, what I was thinking is that Yorgos and I undertook an extensive trip to field work trip to Cyprus about two years ago, including a long stay in the north uh, of the island, uh, which as you know, you know, archeologically is not, it's not an area you can explore, uh, um, well, you can explore it of course, but it's not somewhere that we have uh, a lot of ongoing, you know, archeological investigations. And many things happened to us during that trip uh, um, that really brought us to the reality of how production in this particular part of, of, uh, of the island uh, is uh, always linked with what's happening at the time, mm. um, including what of that we are able to see today. Um, so uh, that, 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 that's, yeah. what, that's what I was thinking that you understand that better. You actually explained to me that better when we were there. Well, I mean, as, as an artist working wherever you're working, I'm currently working in the UK, you, you never work alone. You work with your generation, mainly. You work with the people that uh, have similar concerns. Uh, you work with people that investigate 
similar ideas or techniques. Um, the exhibitions we have are also, I guess, in a way, our our way to communicate our findings as artists and and the results of our own research, in a similar way that you do probably in archaeology with papers. So um, it's never. It's never an organized move, but obviously we feed into each other's practices, we absorb each other's. And it's a little bit like islands, you know, islands like sponges that absorb a lot of things. And um, at the same time, they always have this very distinct uh, character and identity of themselves. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's also you know as as artists as contemporary artists i mean i can speak for myself but uh, you know I, I think many people think in the similar way that we we try to process what is happening now in the world in our communities we try to make i'm a visual artist so i'll speak for myself i try to make visual what is not visual or to put a spotlight onto something that is there, but it's, it's overlooked or unseen. And yeah, I think that's my answer to it. And I had another kind of observation. Maybe it, it is uh, yes, relevant. Yes, question too. <laughs> well, it's relevant, actually, because the two examples of, of uh, artwork that you showed at Anastasia um, were of, of uh, part of this technique that kind of lasted for 100 years, and then it died. And it, it was born out of this necessity of producing something. And when your resources are limited, you, you're forced to be more inventive and creative, therefore more unique. Uh, and then you spoke about islands and these areas as places, of, that, as places that nurture resistance, which the two, these two ideas together, I find very interesting. Um, they're not necessarily talking about the same thing but the idea that like this kind of technique is alive and it's celebrated but then once something has been imported uh, it affects that and then that dies and and it's a sim in a similar way i guess with plants and islands and with animals and islands and like whatever comes into that ecosystem whether that means cultural production or uh, natu the natural world has a huge impact on it and i guess resistance also in a political sense if an idea comes into this closed ecosystem it will also have a huge impact i don't know what my question is uh but no, do you no. have anything more so uh, to kind of like could you talk more about this i guess that's my question <laughs> Yes, no, so that it's not, you know, it's something that I've only recently started looking at, um, but I find it really interesting. I'm actually not entirely 100% enti sure how I'm going to link this with antiquity, but I'm going to try. I need to do uh, um, a lot more reading on, uh, um, you know, relevant historical uh, moments in these islands where we can see that. But I mean, if you look at it from the more, there's obviously far better experts here <laughs> of the um, uh, Byzantine and medieval uh, uh, worlds in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. But I think in many aspects of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, post-antiquity uh, uh, eras in uh, the Mediterranean islands, um, events of uh, resistance are far more stronger felt, or maybe they can become much more, more stronger in an island setting than in the mainland. Um, and that's, to my understanding, this is for two reasons. One, because uh, um, a revolutionary idea can actually take, uh, you know, can gain more ground in a small island uh, or a large island. Um, and uh, also, what on, on the other hand, what we, you know, the, the, I think the fault with looking at island identities, um, at least to my understanding, when I started, you know, doing this work was that we always thought that uh, um, islands uh, uh, are constant receivers. So like they receive ideas from the outside, they receive influences, and they constantly change their own uh, being. This might look like it is happening. But I'm not sure this is what islands feel. 
maybe islands feel more, uh, they are in islanders in control, they have their own agency of what they accept, ident, ad, adapt, uh, or what you know, revolutionary ideas they might actually assimilate. And I want to look more at that um, in relevance with, with antiquity. Um, so yes, I, I don't have a concrete answer at the moment, but this is, is one of the things we want to explore more. Yeah. Okay, well, we've probably got time for one more question, if anyone has one. It's always the case. Yeah, it? It's David, do you want to speak? Please, if I may. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia, for a, a fascinating talk. Um, my question is, do you think there is an essential difference between big islands and little islands? Now, you've chosen three of the largest islands in the Mediterranean for your study. But what if you'd chosen Naxos or Mykonos and Malta, which you have mentioned, or Mallorca? And there are plenty of other islands. Is there an essential difference? Are, are small islands more insular than big islands or less insular? Is there an answer to that? Uh, the answer is I'm not sure. I've thought about it a lot. Um, I think there is definitely a difference between very small islands and very big islands, because very small islands, such as the ones you see in clusters in the Aegean, in the Cyclades, uh, other places in the Mediterranean, are uh, microcosms. Um, at least that's what my understanding is, you know, by looking at uh, um, you know, evidence from places like Cufonicia, you know, islands that are, I'm particularly interested in islands that are, in certain periods of time, they might even become abandoned, but then they become inhabited again, or they were inhabited in times that we considered far more difficult, the early Bronze Age, for example. There are some tiny islands in the Cyclades that had a lot of activity in that time, and that, that activity completely dies out. So I think that phenomenon is, is, is a set of, you know, these are microcosms. They, they develop with a very specific uh, way of living and surviving and with some very specific connections. And I think that is different from the situation you would see in a big island. Big islands like Cyprus and uh, Crete or Sardinia, uh, many times in their history, they, I think they feel and they think like they are continents, you know, they are essentially their own world. And I don't think that's the case with very small islands. Now, islands in the middle range, I'm not sure. Actually, I don't think there is differences. Maybe there are differences of scale, but I think in terms of how fluid their material culture production identity and sense of self-reflection I don't think that's different from uh, big islands. Um, but um, that's again, you know, an, an, an issue of the scale of the project. I wish we could actually expand into looking at categories of very small islands or middle range islands or big islands, but it's impossible. Uh, and it's impossible also because we're never going to find a way to present that in a coherent way to the public. Because the other, the other thing to remember here is that we are not aiming for a group of academics. We are aiming for a, a group of 90,000 visitors. That, that's what our aim is with this project. And we really think hard about what exams we use to make this feasible. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much indeed. We haven't even spoken about Eubea or Evia. Yes, <laughs> which is another uh, really interesting island, isn't it? I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. My yeah. second home, and I didn't speak it? about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I live in a beer uh, when I'm in Greece. Uh, no, um, I don't know. A beer is a weird place. It was very interesting in antiquity, but then um, it's, I think it's because of, of how proc, how yeah. of its proximity to Attica. Uh, I think in many times in its history, it behaved as an extension of Attica. So I don't know, there are, there are other better experts on UB, Irene Lemos in Oxford and other, and other people as well. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'm the best person to, <laughs> to answer yeah. that. But um, uh, Greece is, as a, as a peninsula, is formed by the a clash of two tectonic plates 
isn't it? So, I mean, it is actually incredibly, um, you know, um, both island heavy. Uh, there are lots of islands around Greece, some 1400 or so, but also, I mean, the landscape itself is rather island-like as well, isn't it? With, with uh, you know, think, oh. you know, the Peloponnese is sort of island-like as well. But we, we, we could talk about this sort of thing all night because it's um, absolutely fascinating. I think we're going to have four months to talk about it. So please all come back in 2023 because that's what we're hoping to do. Four months of a debate. Four months of debate around islands and, and Greekness. Yeah, so absolutely wonderful stuff. Um, thank you very much, particularly to Anastasia for a wonderful talk and for handling the questions so well. But thank you also to all participants, everyone who's, who's come along. And we hope to see you for the next one. Keep checking in on the uh, Twitter feed, on the Facebook page, and on the uh, Cambridge, Class, uh, Cambridge uh, Centre for Greek Studies website. Uh, we've got, we're aiming to have from now until the summer, one Greek dialogue per month. And I hope you'll come to all the rest of them. So thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Greg, for hosting as well. Thank you again. I look forward to the next talks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.